the uh, podcast for a uh, Friday, end of the week, um, beginning of the month. How many days to Christmas, Shannon? You counting? Uh, 21. Uh, okay, I'll take it. Sure, three weeks. And, of course, that means uh, 20 days to your Christmas shopping, Bob. Yeah, and, uh, and of course, we all know 7-Eleven is open on Christmas Eve. Well, so I mean, here's um, the nothing, problem. It, nothing you know, finer with, than going Christmas shopping at 7-Eleven. With the pandemic now, with the pandemic now, and everybody doing it online anyway, you, you know, you're going to, you, you know, you'll have to get uh, people to deliver everything on Christmas Eve. Oh, I'm sure there are people out there that are willing to do that. <laughs> and if not, um, the uh, stockings will be empty. Uh, a little hockey chat uh, today to uh, end the week. Our friend uh, Darren Pang of Fox Sports uh, uh, Midwest joins us from St. Louis. Thank you, Bob. And uh, Martin Brodeur, uh, senior executive with the New Jersey Devils, also in St. Louis. Now, you're not visiting Pang, are you, Brodeur? <laughs> Trying to get some money off of him later on today. <laughs> All right. Well, it sounds like a golf game is in order, huh? Um, uh, here's where we're at, as far as I can um, ascertain. And you guys will correct me if I'm wrong. The discussions now revolve around the beginning of a season around the 15th of uh, January. We were chatting a little bit earlier, and Shannon, you said you thought between the 15th and 25th. I do. Yeah, I, I do. I, I think that uh, I, I think that you know slowly there's, there's there's discussions between the New York office of the NHL and the Toronto office. Even though Don Fears in New York, the Toronto office of of the NHLPA, and uh, I think I, I think it's inevitable we're going to get a season. And uh, whether it's 52, 56, 48, you know, as long as we get uh, Darren Pang's game fee up, we're good. <laughs> Marty, what are you hearing? Same thing. <laughs> Yes, you know, it's been really quiet as far as what the NHL is saying. I think these uh, the two parties are talking and hopefully they'll come to, to an agreement sooner than later. I think everybody's really hungry for hockey. So, uh, But on our side, you know, we're preparing like January 1st going to start. You know, as a hockey team, we get behind the eight ball, you know, go ahead and, and get ourselves ready. And, and hopefully the players are doing the same thing. Then. Uh, when we're going to start, you know, everybody's going to be ready at the same time. But uh, obviously, uh, it's imperative that, that we, we play hockey this year. You know, I think for our fans, for our players, for for the game itself, uh, you know, losing a whole year would be uh, would be would be a tough one. That's for sure. We are discuss one of the things that's being discussed now. Apparently, uh, Panger to you is um, a two week training camp. I presume no exhibition games or maybe one or two, Bob. Really? Yep. Um, that seems like a short window, although they are suggesting the teams that didn't make the playoffs in the earlier in the year might get two or three more days. Is that enough time as a player, a former player? Well, you know what? I think nowadays it is, Bob. Um, I think for the teams that didn't make the playoffs, and Marty can speak of this as well, um, that uh, I think what's, what, what's really important for those teams that didn't make the playoffs is, is they get a head start on it. And how many, how many, players can they get in a building at a, at, at a time? Um, I think we're still doing the small groups uh, in, in so many different states and everybody's obviously very careful about that. Uh, but you think of young players, let's say it's Jack Hughes or, or whatever on New Jersey or, uh, you know, the Detroit Red Wings, they, they haven't played in so long and they've got these players that are just hungry to get going. I, I think they'll be ready to go. And, and by the time two weeks comes around, they'll be bored out of their mind. Bob, I remember get, as they got re ready for the bubble, I talked to a lot of the Blues players here, and they were, like, after a week and a half, after two weeks, they were just, okay, let's get this thing started. We're, right. we're a little tired of this, you know, because we're not out of shape. We've been playing. We just had a pause. But, but these guys keep, keep themselves in shape, and, and boredom sets in. When boredom sets in, um, then so does their attention to details and, and their right. attention span. So I think two weeks would be just fine, my, myself personally. But maybe some of the older players would argue with that. Let's remember that uh, in, in, the, in the old world, teams were playing preseason games, three games into camp. You know, it wasn't as if they were, you know, you know going to camp like baseball and playing for, waiting for six weeks and then playing a game. It, they were playing early. Hey, Mar I got to ask you, Marty, th th this is a, a different way for you. I mean, the last couple of times we had lockouts, 
you were one of those guys as a player that had to stay in shape and, and play the short season. How, how This is a vastly different position for you to be in. What was it like as a player then to know that you were going to start a 48-game season? And how did you stay in shape and how did you stay focused? Uh, I mean, obviously, I got a few work, st uh, work stoppages uh, throughout my career, unfortunately. Uh, but, you know, the, the one, obviously, the one was uh, a great memory for us because we won the Stanley Cup that year in 95. So, um, you know, I was young, uh, so it was easy. You know, I think I, I did everything I could to stay in better shape as I could. I didn't have uh, the bad habits that I had later on. <laughs> in my career so that helped uh, <laughs> and uh so you, you you just go you go out and you try to do the best you can uh but like uh, like Pang you're saying like guys are hungry uh, after after a week or so like you're ready to play games you know hockey's second nature for for everybody uh you just gotta make sure you you stay healthy you stay safe and uh you go on it's just it'll be a little tricky obviously with guys coming in from europe uh the quarantine all that stuff, it, it's going to be logistically will be a little bit uh, of a challenge for every single team to get everybody. I know in New Jersey, our restrictions are pretty high. Uh, different places are different. I'm sure the Panthers and, and Tampa, they could do probably whatever they want uh, in Flint, Florida. So, uh, you know, everything is going to be different. Uh, but I think the, the I think every organization is really well prepared. And I think the league is doing a good job in guiding every organization to, to do the right thing for their hockey club to make sure that this come back to play will be as safe as possible. I think that's the most important thing. Hey, so yeah, Marty, mind me yeah. interrupting for a second, uh, no Bob and, and John and Marty. So Marty, if you didn't have that lockout, those 690 wins would be 700 wins or more. And then combined with my 27 wins, we'd be way <laughs> over 725 combined wins. Because yeah. right now we're 718. So yeah, I never saw it like that, Banger, but you're right. <laughs> and, and, and you might be, you might have accumulated, uh, you might have accumulated more than the three Stanley Cups between you as well. You know, yes. <laughs> uh, who, who knows? Everybody's in the same, everybody's in the same boat. So, <laughs> <laughs> you should, now it should be, hey Bob, it should be noted. You know, you know, the guys in San Jose can't skate in their practice facility right now. The guys in Winnipeg can't skate in their practice facility right now. The guys in Montreal, Broussard's not open yet. I mean, there are still some issues in individual locations because of the public health rules in all those areas that Marty was talking about. Well, I'm somewhat offended by uh, Panger's uh, suggestion that uh, he and Brodeur would have 725 wins between them. They excluded you and I. Uh, you could just as easily have said it would be the same number with all four of us, but you chose not to, well, that being the case. Well, you had those dark was... glasses on. I wasn't sure if you could stop the puck. Don't well, you yeah, worry yeah. about me, Panger. Uh, Listen. And, and here's, a, here's an even greater irony. We're sitting here talking about physical conditioning and training camp and how long the players lead, uh, need with a couple of targets who, <laughs> who really only have to figure out how to skate about 10 feet. And once they get their wind to be able to do that, they're pretty much in good shape. Now, you wanted to jump in, John? Well, just, the fact, Darren, is that Bob still thinks he's a goaltender. But once a goaltender, but, always a goaltender. Yes, Isn't that but, right, but, guys. Hold on, that's right. But both always Pang, right. Union, right, Marty? Both, <laughs> both, both Pang and and Brodeur, when they played, actually went down to their knees once in a while to start the puck. Bob, you had the Don Simmons style, you oh, know. No. You. <laughs> oh no, I brought the butterfly in uh, well oh. before it, it was popularized. <laughs> oh, I got a question. I got a question for you two guys. Um, so in many, many, many years ago, uh, when Mike Palmatier was playing for the Toronto Maple Leafs, we used to have ball hockey games on Sunday mornings. And the thing that drove me crazy about Palmatier was he would never want to play goal in ball hockey. He always wanted to play out. Are you guys in that same? Well, Brodeur is nodding already. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm scared of a ball. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, right. <laughs> Did you guys ever? Do you ever? Did you ever fool around? You know, in the driveway with with other guys, or or did you ever play ball hockey, just for fun? Oh, yeah. You did. Oh, yeah. Ask, Mar ask Marty. Go Marty ahead. was a good. In fact, hey Marty, how about that picture that you uh, that you had as a kid? Um, speaking of Mike Palmatier, because Mike Palmatier caught with the wrong hand, the lefty. 
But Marty, yeah. don't you have a picture of you as a kid with with the equipment the wrong way? Yeah, because that's yeah, all you had. Uh, yeah, because my dad used to be a uh, exactly. softball, so I had uh, no choice. <laughs> if so I did... wanted to have any equipment to, to use it, uh, but we played we played a lot of street hockey. You know, I was fortunate, you know, to grow up in Montreal and and the, in, a, in a nice neighborhood that we're able to, to play in the streets and at the park. You know, we they flooded the uh, you know some of the rinks outdoors, and so I played a lot of hockey outside of organized hockey, um, and. Every time I won the Stanley Cup, I brought the Stanley Cup back to my own town. And all the guys that we used to play street hockey, we played uh, for the Stanley Cup that day, uh, <laughs> like a full-fledged. And it was funny. Guys were a little out of shape at times. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> we, had, uh, we had a great time. Won it twice, lost once. So I was, I was still, still above 500. Well, it, fantastic. You know, it's, it's, it's funny. It's funny you say that. I, I, I've been talking a lot about hockey in Quebec, uh, whether it's with just individuals or with people on other podcasts, I think there's a greater passion for the game of hockey in the province of Quebec than anywhere else in the world. Uh, and I think when, when you used to, when you would come into town, uh, it was early on before they moved to the Bell Center, Wilson Center, whatever it is now, uh, you probably played at the forum a couple of times as a pro. There's something special about hockey in Quebec and in Montreal, isn't there? Yeah, it's, like I said, I, I was really fortunate. Like my, my, my dad used to work for the Canadians as a photographer. So I was really close with the organization. But when I would come to Montreal, it, it's probably not because I'm French Canadian, but like just the the atmosphere of a, the, uh, of a hockey day, like when, when the, the Saturday, you know, like usually there's nobody in Montreal uh, drink down uh, in downtown because it's it's not a work day. But the vibe, you went anywhere, you took a taxi cab, you, you walked around, you went to get a coffee at Tim Hortons, everything is about the game. It's a, it's a, it's a fun feeling, like you know you're somewhere. And I played in New Jersey, trust me, Saturday afternoon, you, you didn't know there was a hockey game <laughs> when you walked around town. Was it that way for you, Peng? Was that way for you, Peng, when you went to Montreal? Well, yeah, you know what, Bob, I, I grew up obviously in Ottawa, so... Um, the closest that we had to an NHL team, besides my favorite Ottawa 67s that I grew up idolizing, because that's all we had there. But, um, you know, I was a Montreal Canadiens fan. I had Avon Cornway and Ken Dryden and uh, Lafleur and Lapointe. I had all those. Those posters were wrapped around my room. And I think I think I love the Montreal Canadiens because they were winners. I mean, that's, you know, no offense to Toronto at the time. But, you know, that was going through that 70s. They They weren't winning anything. And I gravitated towards the Montreal Canadiens. And I remember the first time I got to go to the Montreal Forum, it was during the 76 Canada Cup. My dad brought me there to, so I could watch Rogi Vashon play for Team Canada. I'm not sure. If, I think they might have played Sweden. And we sat way up high, but I got to go to the Montreal Forum and I got to watch my hero, Rogi Vashon. And it was the, I mean, it, it kept me motivated my whole life to say that if I could ever play in the Montreal Forum, then that would be, you know, that's what keeps you motivated when maybe there was another path on the road that you could go to with your 13 and 14 and 15 year old friends. But I, I kept it straight and I kept it uh, highly motivated because of that. So uh, the first game I played in Montreal, it was uh, incredible. I had so many relatives and friends that were there. And every time I looked around, I'd see somebody and uh, um, lost the game to Patrick Waugh, I think two nothing at the time. But I, I just thought, wow, I survived that game. I threw up before it. I was so nervous, but it was, uh, it was exhilarating. It was like, it was like nothing I'd, I'd ever experienced after that again. Hey, Marty, and people should know, you talked about your dad working for Canadians. Um, he, he was one of the greatest hockey photographers of all time. Uh, mm -hmm. And some of his greatest work uh, is in the hall of fame. Uh, and, and was also, a, has an Olympic uh, medal. I think 1956, if I'm not correct. I think that's right. Um, that's correct. Yeah. Would he uh, would he sneak you in? Would he sneak you into the game? Let's be honest. Now you don't you, you know. I mean, you don't have to worry about uh, paying. You won't get charged now. Yeah, you, <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. <laughs> uh, you know what? I uh, so two different ways. I would uh, he would pay me like five bucks to carry his uh, his camera bag, so I would go to practice, and I was his. No, it was his carrier, so I had to carry the bag around, and and I got to see a lot, a few practices, some photo shoots of players that he had to do, 
And once in a while, he would bring me, and he always had two seats right along the ice, uh, offensive and defensive. And he would give him and he said, well, just go ahead and take some pictures. And so we were rotated with the brothers who was going to go. Uh, but yeah, I went there a few times, and that's where I decided, you know what, I don't want to be the guy taking the pictures. I'd like to be the guy that is <laughs> somebody's taking the picture <laughs> of me instead. <laughs> oh, that's uh, with, great. With Darren Pang and uh, Marty Brodeur, uh, something that was said a little bit earlier I want to focus on. I may be 100% wrong in this, but most of my life, there has been a goaltender in the National Hockey League who has been the acknowledged best. Uh, now, maybe not the whole time, but Marty, you were one of them for a, a rather long period of time. Um, Panger, you mentioned Patrick. No, Pang Panger wasn't one of them. So. No, you <laughs> mentioned Patrick. <laughs> Sorry, Darren. <laughs> he mentioned Wa, and, and, and he certainly would have been in that category. So it inspires me to ask the question, who's the best right now? Who's that guy? Who's the, is there a, um, if you, if you, if you did a ballot, a vote, somebody that would win hands down as the best. For me, for me, Bob, it'll be, it'd be Vasilevsky um, for his, for his body of work the last couple of years. Um, I, for me, I think right now, I think, I think he's the clear cut guy. Um, and I think that we often forget where Carey Price is just because they haven't been in the limelight, but I would, I would put Carey that's Price right there at good, number yeah. two. So those, those Marty. would be my guys, Marty. It, it, it is hard though, because once you forget about a guy for a year, like last year we would have said this and we probably would have said uh, Sergei Bobrovsky somewhere in there. And this yep. year I could barely get him in my top 10 when I did something for NHL network. So um, I think th that's kind of where I am right now, but I never forget about Carey Price. I think putting him in a winning environment, we saw what he, you know, we know, we know what that guy can do. What about you, Mark? Uh, I yeah, I agree. You know, I think for me, Carey Price is still the best. Um, I think he, he showed it in the bubble, dominant. And, you know, if it wasn't for him, I know Montreal is taking some great steps, but he was the reason why they moved on and, and played so well and looked so good. Uh, Vasilevsky, you know, like you said, uh, is, is right now on top of his game. He's playing on a good team. He's doing the, the right things for his hockey club to win. But I think that's the beauty of hockey right now. There's a lot of talent out there. There's a lot of good goalies. There's a lot of good forwards and defensemen. Every single year, you have to earn that right to be the best. And then that's why you have to appreciate the Ovechkin and the Crosby because they're always mentioned still. And, I mean, they, they've been around for a long time. There's a lot of kids coming up that are pushing the envelope to, to make this game uh, as good as it is now. I'm talking about the Matthews, the Big Davids, and, you know, the Barzell. I mean, talent is everywhere. Compared when I played, you could probably name five of them for, for five years. Mm -hmm. Now, every single year, there's a guy that's coming out of the, the woodworks and, and goes, wow, this guy, I didn't know he was how, how talented he was. And some guys are getting different opportunities in different areas, too, that, that could prove that, you know, and show their talents. I, I may know, be, Marty, I may be more excited about the next wave of goaltenders than I am of, about the current crop right now. And uh, he, you got one of them, Mackenzie Blackwood. You got Shesterov. You got uh, Askarov that was drafted in the first yeah. round. I think this next group of goaltending are are going to be unbelievable for me, anyway. Well, and the, the, hey, listen, the kid across the river in New York and Shesterkin uh, yeah, might Shesterkin be the best of them all. Yep, might be the best of yep. them all. I mean, it, it, what what I want to know is that Marty, when you know, one of the things that you were famous for was you played a lot of games. Now you played behind a really good defense, but you played a lot of games. Are we going to see? that happen ever again are we going to see a 65 to 75 game goalie ever again in the national hockey league no if if it's uh but if a team any successful team won't won't have to do that oh i'm sorry i'm getting a call sorry about that <laughs> um yeah so like i said like i don't think it's going to happen a lot uh but again, if I think a team is stuck and need, needs to put the guy in to, to win games, uh, it might get close to 65. But the reasoning, like I just spent three days with our coaches in New Jersey and we reviewed tapes. And hockey's fast. Ho like the power play, the, the amount of time that is spent in zones now, uh, you know, the overtime, the, you know, the three-on-three, -three, the shootouts. 
it's a lot of hockey, you know, and, and I don't think guys are, are made for it anymore. Uh, it's just kind of a, the way it is. And there's more, there's better goalies, you know, now you're, you need both goalies to, you know, to be successful. So yeah, the, the, the days of, of guys like me and, and, you know, uh, Lundqvist at one point mm-hmm. or Oldby at, and Luongo, I, I think it's gone. I mean, I think it's just the, the game is too demanding. Well, the other, the other part of that is, is and, and correct me if I'm wrong is, is that, goaltenders are expected to practice a lot harder than they used to as well. Uh, and how much wear and tear on the body in practice. Yeah, that, 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 that's a good point because I remember like I was really worried about the way I, I, uh, I practice, you know, uh, sometimes I would go on the ice all the time, but I, I would go on the ice for, for 20 minutes out of the 50 minutes, you know, and, and, and move on and get ready for my game. Now, I mean, teams, you know, the way they prepare, like, you know, I, I'm part of an organization and I see the practice habits. I mean, guys are going full on hard and the disregard about goaltending and practices. It's amazing. Like nobody shot a puck over my, my, you know, my hips, you know, when <laughs> I practice now, these guys are teeing up like, Oh my God, I feel bad for them. <laughs> well, but, I tell uh, you what, yeah, if somebody, if somebody put it on over- more demanding, if somebody put it over your head, you'd be going, you'd be, uh, there'd be a two hander somewhere too. <laughs> yeah. or, or a trip to the minors, one or the other. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not for you. <laughs> Look, I've, I've said this a million times and been criticized a million times for it, but I, I, I really think this whole notion that goaltenders need more rest is poppycock. I, I mean, I... <laughs> I Here, think, we <laughs> Here we go. Here we go. Well, let's let's get right. <laughs> I, I let's get right to it. Well, let's get right to it, Brodeur. You played virtually every other night uh, for most of your career, uh, Panger. You would have played if they'd given you the opportunity, wouldn't you? I mean, goaltenders oh, are every, ready to every, play what, every that's you, night. That's what you want to do. That's of course you exactly do. Right. You don't yeah. want to sit. You don't want your ass glued to the bench uh, for uh, sixty mm-hmm. minutes watching somebody else. This whole idea that goaltenders can't play more than 65 games in a season because they get too tired is just absurd. It is yeah. ridiculous. And if you've got to take if you got to take a day off, okay, here's here's two goaltenders. Wouldn't you rather take a practice day off? For Hanger. Sure. For sure. I, I I listen, it that makes no sense whatsoever. You are absolutely correct. You gotta thank a, you. Four, a defenseman goes up against the other team's best player and plays 32 minutes a night. They get on the ice the next day for, for a skate. The goaltender, depending on, <clears throat> and this is where probably Marty and his staff look at things a little differently than what we did, but the quality of time in your zone. Let's say, Bob, for example, your team, you had 12 uh, minor penalties the night before. You're in Dallas, central time zone, and you know, you're under siege the whole time, and you're pushing post to post and up that could be an exhausting game. Whereas you're turning that around and you're going to fly three and a half hours. You're going to get, you know, to Detroit and you're going to lose time or whatever. So there are circumstances where I totally understand managing the schedule, but by and large, um, you don't often face that, that type of stress during the course of a night. And when you have a conversation with the goalie, if he's on a roll and seeing the puck, great, he wants to get back out there because those are the prime times for a goaltender when you're rhythmic like that and everything's coming at you slowly. You might as well play the darn goalie rather than put somebody else in and, and, uh, and you, you know, and then things don't go so well and you've got a hot goalie sitting on the bench. So Marty, I, I do agree with part of that. Yep. Marty, was it always your decision? Like, well, like whether it was Burns or Lemaire or Robinson or Fatoric for that brief period, was, was it always your decision? Uh, yeah, uh, not, so what we did, like, I had my goalie coach, Jacques Caron, that, that we had a really good relationship with, and we would sit uh, and we would make a monthly schedule, and we would ob- oblige by it almost 100%, didn't matter my performance. So I would say it was three games in four nights, I had to pick one of those games, they felt comfortable for me to take a, a break, I, I would just and 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 uh, and they, but like I said, that's all my games. My bad, <laughs> because I'm sure it was not. Enough. But I was making my own schedule, so I knew exactly when I was going to play, where my my day off is going to be, where I could push, 
in practice where I have to take a little break and everything was scheduled like that. So everybody knew exactly. For the most part, it was like that. Later on, my career got a little different. Uh, but uh, for the most part, not that I decided they wanted me to play. And that's one of the reasons, like I stayed in New Jersey because I was at such a, like, everybody trusted me there. So it didn't matter how I played. I, was, I knew lose, lose or win a game didn't matter. I was going to play again. So to have that comfort as a goalie, it's that's huge. pretty amazing. You, you, yeah, that's huge. And you could keep on rolling. And like Fanger said, like sometimes you're feeling it. That ball it comes in like a beach ball. You know, that puck, sorry. Like it, and it's crazy. And other nights are a little tougher. But, you know, yeah. and even, even there's years that I would look, we were down 3 nothing in the third. I would say, just get me out of there. You know, I would take a look at Johnny Mack or the assistant coach at the time and I said, you know what? Give the other guy a little game. The game is over. We don't get any. We did it in the playoffs. I did it in the game six of the Stanley Cup finals. I started the third period, and they scored a quick goal. The game was 4-5-1. And I looked. It was like, just pull me. They need you for 20, you know? And that's just the kind of relationship I had with uh, the organization. So, that, so I was, I, like I said, I was really, really fortunate. Not many people had that. I tell you what, it's ironic you say that, or maybe it's coincidence yes. that you say Montreal. that. Montreal, based about on tw- 20, 25 years ago this week. Yes. 25 years, Darren, you were there. I was, uh, yes. Uh, and and, it, and Patrick Patrick Waugh at seven to one. Patrick Waugh wanted out, and Mario wouldn't put him. And at Ooh. nine one, he pulled him, and Patrick never played another minute for the hockey club because he felt he was being embarrassed by the hockey club. So that was something else, stuff. wasn't it? Oh, oh. That I was saw the, Mar- I saw the clip. Marty, how old I saw were the you clip when you – Yeah, how old were you uh, when that happened? Was, well, that was, was in – 96. Was it 96. I was in the NHL. So no, I was, it was like, – yeah, it was no, December 2nd, 1995. Um, and uh, uh, the, 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 and it changed the balance of power. It changed the balance of power from yeah, sure east did. to west and – with all due respect to you, Marty, it really actually you were in the NHL by then because you, you yeah. remember you won the mm-hmm. cup in you you won the cup in '95 in the short season, yeah. um, and uh, it it really t- took Montreal out of play for a decade. Yeah, yeah, that was something else. That was you know what think of think of everything that happened that night. First of all, the hands going up, oh, uh, yeah. the 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 Russian five just dominating the. Uh, the fact there was no glass behind the bench, which you'd never have again. He, he'd have to try to, he, hey, excuse me. He'd be trying to <laughs> knock on the, <laughs> excuse me. <laughs> uh, and and presidents, presidents don't, don't send me on the, uh, the, the bench like that anymore either. <laughs> and he goes right by Mario Tremblay, looks at him, and then takes a U-turn, button hooks it right back again. Oh, my goodness. That was something else. It was wild TV. <laughs> it was wild TV. I can tell you that. It's The fascination about yeah. that night for Canadians across the country is that mm-hmm. that, game, that game was only seen in the province of Quebec on Hockey Night in Canada in English. It was seen on the, the Soirée de Hockey in French. It was only yeah. seen on Hockey Night in Canada in the province of Quebec. And yet every Canadian claims they watched it. Yeah. Every Canadian yeah. says, I remember when I saw that. And that was the magic of, and again, my own personal view, the magic of, of what Hockey Night in Canada. And those Saturdays, those yeah. Saturdays that we talk about in Montreal and how important and, and special Saturdays in Montreal were for the whole country. Yeah. That was wow. amazing. Like, I remember growing up, that's, that's all we did. We ordered food and we sat there and, we, you know, later on it was with buddies. Before that was with families. Um, you know, it's something just special. You built the great relationship with your friends and family because of La Suave Hey, hey Marty, I got to ask you something. Bob and I, for years, have had a good friend of yours, and it, we'd like to think he's a good friend of ours on, uh, and that's Lou Lamorello. And I can tell you, in the 25 times we had Lou on the radio show, he told us absolutely nothing. Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> no, no. He, but he made us he made us feel special he made us feel special it was really i mean it was warm conversation but there was there was not one iota of information in anything that lou lou would tell us zero i want to know what you learned from lou and what lou means means to you well you know i think 
you know, I was really fortunate to kind of to grow up in an organization led by, by Lou. Um, you know, I, I think it, it's just the passion. I think he's, he's a guy that, yes, he's serious. Yes, he won't tell you anything, uh, but he cares a lot. You know, he's a person that, you know, whenever anything happens in your career, regardless if it's on the personal level, on the hockey level, he, he's going to be genuine about it and he's going to do everything he can in his power to help you. And uh, he's got a huge heart. Like people don't see that much of him because he's just kind of so serious and he's so driven to do everything you, he can to make his team a, a winning hockey team. And, and that was the beauty for us. Like we knew exactly, like every time there's a, the, there's a deadline, uh, he was going to do everything possible to get our team better. You know, he, sometimes he knew that we're not going to make it. He would pull the ring a little bit. But when he felt that we had a chance to win, if you look at every single time, time that we had a chance to win or we won, the moves that we made at the deadline or sometimes maybe a month before the deadline, so he, he would kind of try to beat the traffic, you know, and, and made yeah. some great deals. And, you know, Alex McGillney and Malkov and a bunch of stuff like that. Um so for, for, for me, he means the world. Still communicate with him at least once a month, uh, you know, regardless if it's for hockey or, or just personal things. You know, I got, I got to know the family uh, really well, and he's got, obviously, got to know my family real well. So uh, now the relationship is great. Um, and like I said, I, I, I was lucky. I've, I've been other places. There's people that are doing a great job. I work with Doug Armstrong and stuff. And everybody that I work with, they all, same question you just asked me. They want to know what yeah. the hell is. <laughs> it's, 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 it intrigues so, everybody. So, but, but, so we get, you go and finish three days of meetings with, new, with the Devils organization now. When you're sitting there talking, do you hear Lou in your mind? Do you hear Lou? Uh, you know, I was never involved with him on, on that part of it. Okay. You know, uh, as far as the management part of it. So I don't know how he was with his people that he worked. Uh, but again, there's things or, you know, talk about rules and this and that. I was like, huh, I don't know if that would fly in our day. <laughs> um, you know, John on, on Bob on a small note, and I'll add to this, this is non hockey related with, with Lou. My son got a golf scholarship from Arizona, uh, to a small college in, uh, called St. Peter's college in Jersey city. And I was a little leery of, of him going from where we were and, and, and to this, this, uh, little small school. And so I called Lou myself to ask him about it. And Lou gave me and my son, obviously he gave my son his cell phone number. Uh, he had security. He knew the, the, the dean there. And every single time I'd see him, he'd always say, tell Tyler to call me. And he'd have Tyler come to the game with the golf team and he'd have tickets ready for him. And he was always asking, how's Tyler doing? And to this day, he'll ask, how's Tyler doing? And so that's non-hockey related. That's a personal side. I, I think I can, I, I can see why the players would have such a great relationship with, listen, with Lou. Uh, listen, Darren, I, I mean, I, I go back. Hey, I'll tell you right now, the year, the year that Marty won the cup the first time was uh, the best probably. So 1995, I had a lot of interaction with Lou because Lou was a bit of a control freak. Uh, and, uh, and, and Claude Lemieux and Marty, on the morning of, a, of, of, of one of the games in Philadelphia in the third round, missed the team bus. <laughs> and, and what happened was they, they didn't know, they, they were at the top of the ramp at the, at the Wells Fargo then, or whatever it was called then, the First Union Bank. And uh, I actually gave Marty and Claude Lemieux a ride back and they made sure that I wouldn't tell Lou that they missed the bus. <laughs> So, <laughs> is that right? So, Mar I'm, I have to drive. I'm, I'm driving. I'm driving back to the. Well, Marty wouldn't remember. It was game day. It was 25 years ago. So, I mean, so I, literally, Mark Askin and I, Mark Askin, who worked for me, we we took we took our minivan and Claude Lemieux and Marty Berdur are sitting in the back of the, the back of the minivan, driving back to the Hershey Hotel. Don't tell Lou that we missed the bus. So, coming back to the arena on game day practice. So. You probably asked for a receipt and, 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 and sent it in, didn't you, Marty? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Sounds reasonable to me. Uh, okay, what hotel, what hotel was that? The Hershey Inn? No, that's... The Her the Her it was the, the Hershey. It was right on the water there. Oh, no, you're talking the, uh, the Sheraton Society Hill, that one? 
Oh, yeah, yeah and that's yeah, the one. Yeah, that, that might have been. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, hey, by the way, you guys yeah. are playing golf today. Who's uh, who's giving whom strokes? I was just going to ask the same question. Um, Marty and I, well, Marty and I have had right, many so, battles. So go ahead, Marty. Yeah. Uh, I'll say, like, you know, you, usually, like, in the pandemic, you know how everybody wants this 2020 to be over with? I feel the same way about my golf game. <laughs> uh, you know, I went from 3.7 index to a 7 index now, Panger, just to let you know you could oh. take a look at the USGA thing. Okay, the gym I'm looking at it right now. So you might have to yeah. give me a, a, few, <laughs> a few more strokes than usual. So. And, does, well, doesn't, it, and doesn't it piss you off that, you know, you, you're a little bigger than Darren and he hits the ball just as far. Doesn't that bother you? Yeah, that's, oh, I don't hit it as yeah, far as Marty anymore. Well, Marty's the, pounding it. Uh, <laughs> oh, you're trying I'm to get those strokes back, though, are you? We, I, I'm, I'm always afraid when we play golf together, we have a nest of a couple of hawks that, that circle the, uh, the courses. And I'm always afraid of Fanger. Like they, they think he's a little cat running around the course. So <laughs> like, so I try to stay close to him. <laughs> well, the hawks are one thing. Vultures are something else entirely. Oh. Um, uh, uh, we are we're, we're, we don't want to keep you from your golf game. Of course, we're extremely sympathetic you, to the to that, and uh, because it's we're, we're getting wet snow here in Toronto, we couldn't give a fly and fado about you two and your golf. Game. <laughs> so, uh, but we'll let you we'll let you carry on and enjoy yourselves the rest of the day. It's uh, always good to see both of you. And uh, thanks a lot for taking a few minutes for, uh, for us here and have a good day. And, you know, we'll talk down the road. I hope. Thanks guys. All right. Sounds good. Thank you. Yeah. Cheers. Thanks very much, Bob, old goalie and you and too, John, happy holidays to all of you guys. Stay safe. Yeah. Merry Christmas. Uh, Darren yeah. Pang and Martin Brodeur on uh, the podcast uh, for today. Well, uh, Take the weekend off, as we uh, always do. And we'll see you back here on Monday with somebody, something. <laughs> Enjoy your weekend. Goodbye. <laughs>